Peter Sokolowski is editor at large at Merriam Webster. He has written definitions for many of Merriam Webster's dictionaries. He is an active blogger, podcaster, and speaker on language, and has served as pronouncer for spelling bees worldwide. Peter will be in conversation with Jess McHugh, who's a writer whose work has appeared in a variety of publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Nation, Time, The Paris Review, The Guardian, among many, many others. Jess has reported stories from four continents on a range of cultural and historical topics, from present day Liverpool punks to the history of 1960s activists in Greenwich Village. Americanon, to be published later this month by Penguin Random House, is Jess's first book. Jess and Peter, thank you so much for being with me this evening at the library. It's such a pleasure to host you. Thank you for the invitation and, and welcome, Jess. It's a terrific treat to see you. <laughs> um, and congratulations. I, I actually forgot this was your first book because it, it, it's so mature and it's so elegant. And there's something about this, this uh, treatment of this subject. And we've chatted a little bit about uh, your book, of course, and we'll talk a lot more, but I'm not gonna embarrass you, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna read your, your, epi your, epigra your epigraph. <laughs> uh, because I think it sets, I think it sets the table. It's Ralph Ellison uh, writing, "That which we do is what we are. That which we remember is more often than not that which we would like to have been, or that which we hope to be. Thus, our memory and our identity are ever at odds. Our history ever a tall tale told by inattentive idealists." And you know, we could spend the whole hour talking about that little passage, um, but it's such a beautifully chosen passage and I'm gonna ask you about it, but I'm just gonna set the table by saying, you bring up in that choice, uh, the idea of myth, the idea of identity, this idea of aspiration uh, that is part of your, your longer narrative. Uh, and also, as, as you know, that I'm gonna bring up this idea of, of nostalgia of, of nostalgia of maybe for something that had never existed before, right? For some kind of idealized thing. And it makes me think right away of some of the founding documents of, you know, the, uh, that all men are created equal. That is such, such a problematic phrase from its very beginning because of gender, because of race, because of class, because of so many things that the truth that it thought it was telling is not the, tr the truth that we know today. And to me, that sets up this discussion that you have in, 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 in your book, a conversation about uh, our culture using this term canon, uh, which we normally associate with a literary uh, group grouping, but here is a broader cultural grouping. So first, can I ask you to comment on the Ellison epi epigraph? Um, and then we're going to go into some of the ways in which you explore this idea of myth and identity and nostalgia. Sure, well, I think, you know, Ralph Ellison says it much better than I could ever do. But to me, the kind of the heart of it is that in writing a book about history, we're essentially writing a book about memory. And memory is kind of all of the things that you mentioned. It's culture, it's identity, it's also imagination. So I think that's a lot of what plays into the way that we have understood our history and are perhaps trying to understand it better now is that there is this gap between what we believe in ourselves and what we are both for better and for worse. And so that was kind of one of the major themes that I wanted to look at by exploring this sort of alternative canon, which is something we can talk about more. Yeah, exactly. It's an alternative canon, isn't it? Because, and at the same time, of course, what I, what, you, what, what I realize is, and it's astonishing to me that, that your idea, it, it, it seems so received. It seems like we've always had a text that addressed this alternative canon, that addressed um, this much broader brush, this, this, this way of, of uh, addressing American culture um, from within that does not have to do with the exclusionary elements of literature, for example, um, which is only for the educated or only for a certain class of people. And in this case, what you were addressing is, you know, to begin with, the Farmer's Almanac um, as your first chapter, which is a revelation. Now, as it happens, and for the rest of you, Jess and I have a few things in common. One is that we're both from Greater Boston or Boston itself. And um, the other thing is that we both sort of were attracted to Paris in one way or another that we, um, and so, I mean, I don't know you, Jess, but we, we have, I think th those two things in common, but coming from New England, 
I grew up certainly knowing the Farmer's Almanac and certainly seeing it everywhere. I'm not sure I could even tell you who subscribed and who didn't. It was one of those books that was just on the, you know, it was sort of in the bathroom or it was in the dining room, it was on the table. And uh, this goes back to before the founding of the country, right? Right. Yeah, it's it's such a fascinating book. And I'll and I'll say to kind of frame it a little bit more, my understanding of canon was that I kind of wanted to upend the the Harold Bloom notion of great books and novels and all of that. Because what was interesting to me is, you know, if if you were to look at the bookshelf of an average American in, you know, 1792 or 1892 or 1992, what were the books that they had? And what were the books that they kind of read and reread and looked at every day? And so that's how I kind of came to this idea of almanacs and cookbooks and dictionaries and things that not only you consult more than once, but you treat as an authority because it's nonfiction. It's not a novel. You're not kind of analyzing, is this true? Is this not true? Does it apply to me? The idea is the information is there and it's here for you to get. And so I chose this first one, both because, you know, seven, it starts in 1792 and it's still being published annually. They sell something like three million copies, which is staggering. And I think what is so fascinating about it is that you see from the very start, we're trying to formulate this notion of identity around agrarian roots and this idea that Americans are all farmers and we're kind of planting the seeds of our prosperity into the earth and they're literally flourishing. And, and to an extent, of course, I think, again, I come back to, there's a partial truth, which is that yes, a lot of early Americans were farmers or did farm in some extent, but you see, the almanac really take off in the 20th century when people aren't farming and they're looking at it kind of on the outside, looking in at this sort of nostalgia for an easier time or a simpler time. And, and I think that's what it's come to represent over time. Yeah, you say that, and I love your, you have this, um, this you, you say that there's something reassuring and even maybe escapist uh, about it. And that's, I guess that's how it felt even organically to me, seeing it in people's homes, just saying, oh yeah, that's that thing that's always been there and always will be, you know, that, that kind of thing. But you have this lovely turn of phrase, you say it's the, the practical and the poetic put together because uh, the things that are in the Farmer's Almanac, for those of you who aren't familiar with, things like weather weather reports and when to, when to plant your w crops, um, but also this sort of folksy wisdom that uh, is associated with, with um, that kind of 18th century New Englander. Um, but it, it, there's this wonderful um, parable of American anti-intellectualism, that story about um, you, you look better fed than taught, uh, <laughs> which, was t which was actually spoken to the publisher, right? Of, of the, mm -hmm. I mean, could you explain that a little bit more? <laughs> and and, and the, yeah. these characters. So I think this is sort of typical of the notion of of early Americanness was that we don't need neither clergy nor aristocrats. Uh, we have what we need from the soil and from each other and this limited government. And so there's this parable that he tells in an early almanac at, a, at an early almanac edition wherein a clergy member stops this farmer and, and, and he doesn't get out of the way fast enough essentially. And the clergy says, you know, you are better fed than taught. And he says something to the effect of, indeed, sir, for you teach me and I feed myself. Mm. And I think that that just about sums it up. But the almanac is one of those books that I just, I love and I still read and it's on my bedside right now. And it's, it's again, sort of as you it's described, it's so hard to explain because the early editions in particular are fascinating because on one page, you'll have a recipe for refining sugar. On the next page, it will have, you know, the salary of every member of Congress. The page after that will be Quaker meeting houses. And then after that, it will give you a timetable for mating your cows. And so it's just kind of everything you need and it's not sacred, it's not heavy, you can carry it around. And I also, like you said, you know, it's a call to observe the natural world. And I, I like to say that there's something a little bit mystical about the almanac because it reminds us to look at the sediment of daily life, to count acorns and to watch what the cows are doing and to avoid killing spiders. And I think that's something that's increasingly unusual and, and quite beautiful in our world. Oh, absolutely. And that's, and it, that's its appeal to us to this day, as you say. Right. You also, I mean, kind of, but there's so much to this history, but that wonderful anecdote about uh, a Nazi spy who was found in uh, uh, off the shore of Maine, I believe, 
um, mm -hmm. with a copy of a farmer's almanac in his pocket, <laughs> um, which, which just speaks to, and it was presumed that it was for the, the, the tides or the weather reporting. Mm -hmm. um, and it speaks to the ubiquity and the importance, but also the deep cultural meaning of this, that it was thought important enough that, uh, you know, a spy is going to carry this as a, almost as a guide. Certainly. And I think it speaks to the point of just how entrenched the old farmer's almanac is in American history. There are so, I found uncovered so many tiny and improbable details of it interacting with their history. There was this one example of a young lawyer named Abraham Lincoln, who's defending someone in a murder trial. And the uh, witness says, oh, I saw him by the light of the moon. And all, uh, Lincoln takes the farmer's almanac, sees that there was no moon that night and gets the guy off. And I think it's similar to this story of this Nazi spy who lands on, I think it was Manhattan from a U. Okay. And the only book on him in his coat pocket is the old farmer's almanac. And it's, it just is kind of like of all things to have, this is the thing that kind of accompanies us in so many strange ways. And I found that with just so many of these books. Yeah, exactly. And so that leads us in some ways to this pragmatism um, that's part of the American myth, that's part of the American culture. And it leads us to, the, your second chapter is on Noah Webster himself. So th th this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart, obviously. <laughs> um, and um, it's a thrill to be able to talk to you about Webster and Webster's life. Um, but you know, the idea, of, um, I'd like you to set the table of Webster as an, a fellow Yankee, another New Englander, um, with a similar mission, not in the natural world, but in the world of language. Yes, so it's true. The first few chapters I'm realizing skew very New England. I'm gonna blame it on just kind of what was happening at the time, but yes. So Noah Webster is kind of the guy who who kicked all of this this book off for me because he's so fascinating. But essentially, I you know like many others grew up with Merriam-Webster's dictionary and hadn't thought much of it. I assumed that it was kind of designed by a committee of people, much like you know here in France. And so when I discovered that Noah Webster was this really adamant patriot, I would say even nationalist who believed that American English could be as different from, you know, Dutch as, as Dutch was from German, have you. And the idea being that language and the creation of language can be a rallying point around which not only we can differentiate ourselves from our enemies, the Brits, but we can rally around this new identity that's built on things like Christian values and this new literature that's being created. And it just was so fascinating to me that this, this book that we take as, as so innocuous really had quite a profound ideological thrust behind it. And I'm sure you can speak more to that. Well, absolutely. I mean, not only nationalist, but, and as you point out, sort of Christianist, if right. you would. Um, and because, and that's another peculiar, there's so many things about this that um, are peculiar to America, it seems mm -hmm. to me. This peculiar um, religious zealotry um, from the Second Great Awakening uh, and Webster referred to himself as a born again Christian. Um, and and uh, as a consequence, actually, I'm just I'm going to let you tell this because I think it's so fascinating. If one were to uh, purchase a, a copy of Webster's dictionary as it was in his lifetime today, how would one go about doing that? One would have to find a, a, what is essentially a Bible society, if I've understood it correctly, but it's fascinating. I mean, they, the, eight, the 1828 dictionary is out of print and the, this, this biblical society has digitized the entire thing. And I used it throughout my research because they saw it much as Webster saw it as kind of a gift from God. And he believed that there was this, you know, one biblical language from Genesis and had this meeting with God in his study when he's writing the dictionary. And so, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It's still used by homeschoolers today, as are a few of these other books. And I think you had mentioned that homeschoolers sometimes ask you if Merriam-Webster will reprint it. Yeah, I mean, th and this is just a, I don't want to interrupt your narrative, but it's one weird way in which I intersected with this story, which was um, a, a going to book fairs and uh, and conferences, and I would be at, at the stand, at the Merriam-Webster stand. So I'm just a guy in a suit. They don't know, they don't, they just think I'm a salesman or something. That's fine. And people come to me and they say, do you still sell the, uh, the 1828 original Webster's Dictionary? And I always, initially I was surprised. I thought, well, why, why would you, I mean, who would want such a thing? And several times, very serious people said, well, well that is um, how we uh, educate our children because, and this is an interesting turn of phrase, it's the only dictionary based on the Bible. <laughs> and so that's how it came, that's how it came down through the years to those people. 
Um, and sure enough, this biblical, um, this Bible uh, publisher uh, reprinted it um, through the years and now put it online in a nice online version that I use for research for, you know, scholarly purposes. Um, but it's just interesting because, for example, I mean, you could say that about any dictionary would, would, would be essentially because the Bible in the 18th century would have been an essential uh, text. Of course, uh, Johnson, for example, in England, of course, he based his dictionary on the Bible also, but not from a religious perspective, but from a more strictly linguistic perspective. The difference with Webster is that he didn't make a distinction uh, between those things. And I find that to this day, absolutely astonishing. Um, but what a character in American culture and the thing is, too, the idea of it starts to happen of a, of a kind of identity of a homogeneity that, that, that Webster was creating an American character through an American language um, at, at a time when uh, there were many languages spoken, many dialects spoken. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it also served in a way as a kind of social climbing device. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder if you could. Um, speak to that. I mean, it, what I mean by that is the uh, United States has no official language, uh, not a legal language, France does. Um, and it's, it, it, it's an interesting fact that Webster changed so many spellings and those spellings became associated with what we now call American English. So he had this huge influence. Yes, it's, it's true. I think, you know, so many of the spellings, but also so much of his ethos, you know, as we mentioned, just the, the way that that biblical language and religious language is such a part of American life in a way that would be unheard of in a country like France, for instance, is something that always struck me in doing the research. The other thing you noted was social mobility, which I found fascinating and is one of the aspects of the dictionary that we no longer think about. <clears throat> which was that, and a lot of the scholars that I interviewed said, especially in, you know, 18th, early 19th century America, when there was no public school, people were educating themselves at home with, you know, a primer and a dictionary, maybe if they were lucky and had the means. And even just owning the dictionary, having it in your home was kind of a sign of wealth or prestige. And there was this notion that, again, because there were fewer rules, society was more in flux in terms of class, that if you could speak like an educated person, there really was no difference between speaking like an educated person and being an educated person. And I think a great example of this uh, is Frederick Douglass, who taught himself how to write using uh, a Webster book. And I think, again, it kind of speaks to the fact that these books intersect with history in strange ways, but also that people are not using them then in the way that we use them now. It was really much more central to their notion of learning, of reading and writing, speaking, and of being American, I think. You know, went, and again, just a little personal anecdote, when I read that passage in your book, it made, it made me immediately think of something that happened when I was in the office, which was we granted uh, permission, uh, trade, uh, uh, trade permission, uh, copyright permission for a film uh, project to use uh, our dictionary. Um, and it was a copy of a dictionary from the 1950s. And I didn't understand initially what it was, but it was for the film Malcolm X, uh, yeah. because Malcolm X uh, taught himself uh, while in prison uh, and using a Merriam-Webster dictionary um, was guided by older uh, acquaintances who told him to, you know, improve his, himself th through the dictionary, and he did. Um, so it's interesting that, that that story echoes through the, the generations and, and, and through the, you know, through the culture in so many different ways. Now, I'm going to um, make a little trans. Now, and Webster, there's another point that Webster makes, uh, and, and it just blows my mind, is the prediction that he made of American success, mm -hmm. um, which is to say that in the preface of his first little dictionary, 1806, um, he, he, he presents his case, a kind of nationalist case, America should have its own language. Um, and he said, this will be the dominant uh, form of English, and it will one day be spoken by, in his word, 300 millions of men which in 1806 was by no means a, a certainty uh, and it's truly an astounding prediction. Um, and he was, he was basically right, uh, kind of an amazing thing. But Webster was a young man and he was very politically oriented. As you said, he was a nationalist, he was a, a Christianist, he was also a federalist. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he knew, and that's the interesting thing, Jill Lepore, the historian Jill Lepore um, refers to Webster as a founding uncle. 
you know, not one of the founding fathers, but because he was around that orbit and he was personally acquainted with George Washington and with Benjamin Franklin, they were friends. And so I, I'm gonna lead to the next chapter, Benjamin Franklin, uh, with the anecdote that during the Constitutional Convention, Franklin was a widower and Webster was not yet married. So they were two of the only um, essentially unaccompanied men, single men um, in Philadelphia and they became friends. Uh, and uh, the older uh, man and the younger man and among other things, uh, they talked about language uh, as well as politics. And of course, Franklin among his many, many, many achievements um, was also kind of a, a linguist and he had invented a, a phonetic alphabet to spell English in a way that it sounds, which of course we we all know doesn't exist, uh, but um, he um, he entrusted that uh, project to Webster, who of course didn't change uh, the, the the alphabet of English. But nevertheless, Franklin and the great autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, an enormously influential and important book in American culture, but also this character of Franklin that he sort of invents. Um, I think we can talk a lot about, it, and also that it intersects with with France. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I, so the, the third chapter in my book is about Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, which is, you know, one of the kind of perennial bestsellers. It's been on, I don't know how many thousands of syllabi. And I think to some extent, even if people haven't read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, they know his story. It's such a foundational kind of, I would argue it's the first self-made man, racks to riches tale in American history. And it comes out in the, the late 1790s or early 1790s. And what I find most fascinating about Franklin is that, like you said, he, he really is a performer. And one of, I think, his legacies in American culture is this kind of chameleon-esque knack he has for adapting himself into the situation. And so one of my favorite Franklin anecdotes is that, you know, it's, it's 1776, he gets sent to France to try to get money and finances and votes from the king to, to you know, finance the war in America. And he knows that he can't meet the French on their terms. And so instead of showing up, you know, well-to-do and well-dressed, he borrows, a, I think it's a Martin fur cap. He wears these spectacles and he wears this kind of woolen suit. And he just, he dresses as the kind of frontiersman that the French in, imagined Americans to be. And he just, to borrow an expression, charms the socks out of everybody. I mean, women are buying wigs to look like Franklin's hat. People have his face on wallpaper, they have his face on snuff boxes. And it's just this notion that the performance alone is really all you need to succeed. And that's been a through line in American history to the extent that it is true or not is another question. But for Franklin, it certainly worked. It's astonishing. I mean, you, you, your phrase, I love this, his legacy is a kind of subtle deception. Um, <laughs> And that his, you know, his life was a kind of performance of that. And so he recognized that this sort of, um, you know, uh, agrarian country gentleman uh, was a role that he could play. And if you think about his life in America, that was not who he was, um, but that was certainly the role he played in France. And of course he's there during the, the reign of Louis the 16th. So a, a time of sort of glittering glamorous royalty. Um, and he was the guest in all the, best houses and all the rest of it. He was a true celebrity. Um, and it, it's just a kind of a fascinating thing, but also he's establishing this kind of American ethos of success. Um, and what I mean by that is in his narrative, he's the youngest son of the youngest son. I mean, he's this poor boy um, who, who makes good, who, be, who, who, who moved from Boston to Philadelphia and becomes so successful that he's able to be essentially independently wealthy. Um, to move on to other projects that include science, as we all know, but also politics. Um, and so it's just, it, he's just a fascinating figure. You can almost hardly imagine America without this figure. I mean, George Washington is understood, I think, more as a statue than as a, as a man. Um, but Franklin is this oddly um, important human figure in, 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 American, in American history. And, but also his book, you say is a self-help book in the sense that people would dip into it for advice uh, and reference, you know, to kind of go back to this passage. And in that sense, it's unusual as a, as a narrative. Yes, exactly. Because it, it has this section called the 13 virtues where he lays out, you know, his, his virtues for success, such as temperance and, and kind of other things of that nature. And he gives you this grid of each day you're supposed to check off your, you know, your success in these virtues. And he claims that he adds the 13th virtue, humility, because somebody tells him that this plan is, is too prideful. Uh, so in that way, I really do think it is, 
in some ways you could argue the first self-help book because that section exists out of time. It, you don't need to read what became what came before it or what came after it to understand it. And you really see for the first time a blueprint of American values laid out. And like you said, you know, he is, it's hard to imagine America without Franklin for so many practical ways, but also his 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 character is is everything that we like to imagine we are you know he's a scholar but he's not an intellectual he's he's humble he's smart he's fun and i think there's a lot to be cheered in that the other thing that i also like to point out in this chapter is that there's an, a kind of an aspirational element and there's an attainability that he sells and that all self-help books sell, which is not always possible. I mean, Franklin was, I would argue, a genius. He did everything. He had a successful printing business. He was a diplomat. He was a scientist and also just a very strange man. He took these naked baths in the window. He wrote an essay about farting. So I think this, this idea that we can all be like Franklin if we check these boxes is a, a little bit misleading. <laughs> And actually, and that hasn't changed at all in in terms of self help books to this day. That that often often people and you you have this lo another lovely phrase, man as a perfectible machine, um, as a description of, of of Franklin and his ideals. But also, I would I would argue as this kind of enlightenment ideal mm -hmm. um, that is it, it, that to me is 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 in all of these. Um, chapters so far that um, that that Webster was also clearly a product of the Enlightenment and the Farmer's Almanac this 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 hard-headed pragmatism um, was an American version to me of, of this kind of Enlightenment ideal um, that it wasn't the preacher or the teacher it was the farmer um, exactly. and, yeah, and I, I think that's, I think that's Oh, sorry, I think that's huge in these first, you know, especially in these first three chapters in the 18th century and kind of the American Enlightenment and this notion, not only that it is to know it is possible to know everything, but this idea that, you know, farmers and laymen, and as Franklin says, the youngest son of the youngest son five generations back might be better placed to understand this knowledge of the universe than the aristocrats and the clergy of the world. Yes, but to rise to, as you point out, to rise to where he did mm -hmm. uh, was excep exceptional by any measure. Now, the next chapter is, I think, where you finally have this intersection of canon uh, with a proper canon as we normally understand it, because it's literally the text, uh, the textbook uh, by which generations are uh, educated. And I have to say, for me, this was some of the most uh, new material. I was not familiar with the McGuffey readers um, as, 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 as much as I sh clearly should have been. And um, maybe that's partly ge geographical, but um, th this idea of these, um, these textbooks that became massive best bestsellers and essentially established a scholarly or, or, or scholastic identity and curriculum, um, but also a kind of set of values, a kind of a set of religious uh, background um, and a set of uh, a sort of circumstances for American students for generations that have, I think, I think influenced the way to this day we think about public education. So the McGuffey reader, can we, you have to start uh, with, with this story. And, and the idea of memorization to talk about memory and memorization, you know. Yes, yes. So the McGuffey readers are, are one of those books that, I, again, I had never heard of, and I'm going to blame it on being from Boston and not Ohio, but they sold something like 122 million copies over the course of a century. They came out in 1836, 1837. And again, this is at the, on the cusp of public schooling. And so a lot of people were educating themselves with these primers at home because it goes from learning the alphabet all the way up through to, you know, Washington Irving and literature samples for, for high school students, but they're also increasingly being used in public schools. And again, you have this kind of extreme, I would argue, person who writes them, who is William Holmes McGuffey. He's raised in this log cabin on the Western frontier that his parents built out of the surrounding trees. He becomes a Presbyterian minister and he works at this tiny school, uh, Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, that at the time was also built out of the surrounding trees and he helps clear the forest. And he writes this kind of book that is essentially a, a sort of civic religion. It's, it's very much, in my opinion, guided by Presbyterian ideology and Protestantism, but it kind of translates those into frontier values and, uh, you know, stories about animals and young children and consequences instead of damnation. Yeah, and, and that's exactly right. This, this, this substitution of consequence mm 
for mm -hmm. damnation, but that consequence that, that it, what what is inherent in that is morality, right? That that you're not teaching just school subjects, mm -hmm. but the Bible is the national text as well. Exactly. And he's very clear about that. He says, you know, something like, from no other text has this author drawn so scrupulously as from sacred scripture. And there were many, many people, one historian I interviewed went so far as to say the vast majority of people in the common school movement were born again Christians or evangelicals of some kind. And the notion again, which I would argue is still true for people today, not in the Christian sense, is that we understand public school as an institution that's doing us, that's doing something more than teaching us how to read and how to count. It's teaching us us how to think back in the day it's teaching us how to be Americans and it's and it's teaching us you know how to kind of reckon with the world around us how to see our relationship to others and Mugafi recognized that I, you know I might not answer those questions in the same way that he did but he was certainly grappling with them in a very real way yeah, and fi finding ultimately as a shaper of culture, as you say, a common culture um, and a common heritage. And what's interesting about that is that um, they only become common and shared by virtue of him choosing them. You know what I'm saying? That because so many students use these texts, they all now had a shared culture. Um, they may not have had one before, but now they do. Um, right. And um, so, I mean, that's what's fascinating about this is the, the, the influence of this textbook um, among other things, and it's something I learned from your book that I wish I cannot believe I didn't know, was that McGuffey used Webster's own spellings, which is partly how uh, Webster became the great successful reformer of spelling. So just for, for, the, for, for our audience, I will explain that what we call American English spellings are the differences between British English and American English, the things that we're all familiar with, but you might never have thought of. Like, the RE for ER in words like center and theater, um, the U dropped from words like color and honor and humor um, and, uh, and double consonants. Uh, Webster hated silent letters, he hated double letters. So uh, an American typically will spell traveling with, with a single L or canceled with a single L as opposed to, so those are the kinds of changes that, and things like the K at the end of words like music and public, things like that, um, which you could defend some of them by phonetic reasons, but some of them were just simply cultural differences that were in the ethos, but Webster put them in one place and then McGuffey used them, which meant if you were educated with that system, that would be the system that would succeed. So I, I view McGuffey as being maybe more important than anything uh, for Webster's own success, which is just astounding, astounding to me. Exactly. Yeah. We think, have so you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was, I was just gonna say, you know, it, I think it speaks to the fact that, you know, we think of our culture as a sort of agreed upon set of values that we've all kind of decided are true or right or helpful. Uh, but the deeper you look into it, the more that you see a lot of the times these decisions about what our values should be or what we should all believe in are coming from the small group of, as we've seen, very interconnected people. And yes. a lot of what they're doing is taking some aspect of things that people might already believe in, such as meritocracy or Christianity or what have you. And then they're, you know, mixing in their own personal preferences, their own ideology, their own childhood, their traumas even, and kind of blowing it up into some new thing that then becomes part of the culture when a hundred million people read it. Right, right. It's, it, it's, an, it's, an, it's an amazing thing for a, for a country that doesn't have a thousand years of, <laughs> Of, of culture. Um, and so for a non-European country, it is something different. Now, uh, and we're going to move on to the next your next chapter on, on Catherine Beecher, um, which and, and, and her text uh, talk about identity. Talk, I mean, talk about like, you know, forming an identity, women as gatekeepers of the moral fate of the country, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, that's a big responsibility. Um, and it may be, uh, uniquely American, but this homemaking as a symbolic task of essential goodness mm -hmm. um, does strike me as a superimposition of morality onto domesticity, um, which I think we take for granted partly because of the success of her texts, right? Definitely. And she was, Catherine Beecher, you know, is, is part of the Beecher family. She writes 
I spoke with her sister, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who's obviously uh, slightly more famous than her. And the, but it was part of a much broader movement about the cult of domesticity and this notion that the way you keep your home, the way you raise your children is not only a reflection of you, but a reflection of the country and its health. And so it, what's fascinating to me about her, and at first I, I had, you know, a little bit of a hard time with her because she's she's kind of saying, you know, the way you scrub your toilets is, is, is saying something quite profound about you. And I struggled with that at first, <laughs> but it, it fits into this broader notion that we come up with these ideas about identity when things are really in flux. And so her first book comes out after an economic crash. It also comes out in the midst of tons of new immigration to the United States. And she's really asking the question about what kind of people do we want to be? What shared values do we want to have? What do we want that to look like? The second one comes out right after the Civil War. And a lot of it is about, you know, we might not have much in common or we feel as if we have nothing in common with the South and they feel as if they have nothing in common with us. But the only thing we do share is the home. We all have households. And back in the day, we all had children. And, and the idea was, you know, this is where we're going to find common ground. This is how we're going to heal the nation, which is quite radical for a book about homemaking. And I found that really surprising. Yes, and she was a fascinating figure. I mean, she herself not married, right, um, and and without children, uh, and so I mean, these characters are are, are so vivid in, in in your text. And uh, but she leads us to in this idea of of manners um, as being so important to identity. I mean, she did for manners what Webster did for spelling, essentially. You know, sort of established this idea, and that that project is continued with Emily Post, mm -hmm. um, who is a name that would be familiar to most of us as opposed to Catherine Beecher. And, uh, and that uh, Emily Post's work, it kind of takes it to the next level, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Emily Post is, is so fascinating to me. She, again, was one of those authors that I'll admit I had some preconceptions about coming in. I think I associated her with, you know, white gloves and tea and, and all of this. And I was just so surprised to learn that she was this, you know, social, socialite scorned when her, her husband got caught up in this showgirl affair slash blackmail scheme. I mean, it's just completely out of some, like something out of a movie. Anyway, so she writes this, this huge book that's about correcting errors and manners. And I see a lot of it as, as her trying to correct the manner, shall we say, of those around her. But what's fascinating and, and, and deeply American about it is this idea that she explicitly says in the book, she says, you know, you don't need to have come from wealth. You don't need to have come from class. Here's literally everything that you need. It might be 500 pages long, but if you can memorize it, you can walk among us. And that's all that we ask of you. And so again, it's this kind of, it's, it's towing this line between as, the aspirational and what is possible. And to a certain extent, perhaps that's true for some people. To another extent, you know, it, it doesn't take into account things like gender or longstanding poverty or, you know, the color of your skin. And I think that's something that is dissected more and more when you think about etiquette kind of over the generations. Well, and this brings up an important point because I mean, for example, this, the description of manners of the wealthy becomes a prescription for everybody else. In other words, that's the, you know, the, the, the ticket into our party is to learn our way of doing things. And I want to make this point just, be, you know, because we have limited time, we will, we're certain we have to talk about Carnegie and, and Betty Crocker, but but I do, I do want to make this point because you you throughout the book and I don't because we're trotting so quickly I don't want to I don't want to miss this point throughout the book you 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 do bring up the the complications of creating a culture based entirely on the successful white uh, published uh, version of mm -hmm. American culture and so it, 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 to the extent that that is a kind of a sculpture of American uh, character. There's the kind of negative of that. There's the there's the part that we don't see, um, the, and the, and the part that uh, is left behind, or the part that is deliberately not mentioned. You know that Benjamin Franklin uh, had enslaved persons. Mm -hmm. um, that the, and and that um, uh, the people who were able or privileged enough to publish were the ones who were uh, who were followed in these trends. And I, I pointed out to you um, 
uh, as a parallel with the dictionary, which is that the, the basis of the dictionary is always published writing, right? So that um, Webster uh, based his dictionary on people who had written books. Well, who were, who were the authors? I mean, they were almost all white men. So the dictionary becomes a, re a record of that slice of culture. And it's always going to be this interesting kind of dynamic between what is the residue of this culture that is that is uh, that has a a, 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 a a sort of tactile physical quality and the part of the culture that has been ignored or left behind and my, my point is you you address this in a number of different ways yeah exactly i think yeah that's, that's an excellent point a lot of what i talk about is you know we sometimes talk about america as a classless society uh or as a non-aristocratic society but the people kind of long for certainty, they long for structure. And so they kind of impose a structure on themselves. And the way that we've sort of imposed a social structure was wealth or success and, and not necessarily both. But the idea being a lot of the things that we do or a lot of people that we admire, we admire because they're wealthy or because they're successful. And with Emily Post, the idea was we do th things thinking that they're the right way of doing things, but they might just be the wealthy way of doing things. And so that's something that I try to address a lot in this book is that so much of any canon, even this sort of alternative canon that I've come up with here, means that so, so many voices are left out or repressed. And a lot of people were, you know, really, uh, I would say quite consciously thinking about that. Someone like Webster was really thinking about having a homogenous society, as was Emily Post. As, were, as was, you know, Betty Crocker. These are very white visions of America. And so that's something that I, I try to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Peter, and Peter, I'm gonna have to jump in because we've received so many questions. In the oh. chat. <laughs> I know that you have great plans to work through the entire book chapter by chapter, but we <laughs> do have to ask. Well, Dale Carnegie, we, we, we can exhibit, we can exemplify Carnegie rather than talk about him. How about that? <laughs> we can exemplify the book for sure. And I've just posted the link um, for the book and you should all pre-order a copy of Jess's fantastic first book, American Canon, in the, in the chat. If you've just joined us, you've stumbled in on a fascinating conversation between Peter Sokolowski and Jess McHugh to discuss Jess's first book. And this is Jess's first book event as well. So it's a, it's a night of firsts. <laughs> um, we are now moving to the question and answer section of the event. So Jess, I will be posing some questions that I've received. Um, the first question comes from Bonnie and it was one that I was wondering myself. How did you choose the books and why 13? Yes, this is a great question. Um, so I wanted to choose books that, that span the full scope of American history from you know the revolutionary era through the end of the 20th century. And to kind of avoid bias, I tried as much as I could to rely on uh, the data. So I was looking at their status as bestsellers and I looked at lists like Publishers Weekly, the New York Times. And so I was, I was trying to find which were the kind of how-to nonfiction books that consistently sold the most and influenced the greatest number of people throughout history. But I also kind of, I wanted to, I also looked at, you know, newspapers, magazines, academic archives to see which books sort of struck a chord in in the the kind of national conversation which authors went on to you know have syndicated columns write secondary books and I also interviewed a ton a ton a ton of academics and historians to kind of speak about which books hit an inflection point in the culture so yes and why 13 I love the number 13 I don't I know that it's sort of considered bad luck but it just sort of worked out that way. And I had a list of so many over many, many years and I couldn't get it down to 10. And so that's how I ended up with 13. What was on the short list? What, was also, what else was on the short list? So, so, so many books were on the short list. I almost put in uh, Narrative of Life of Frederick Douglass. Uh, I almost put in uh, Who Moved My Cheese? Cause that's a kind of a funny book to me. Uh, there were a few others and now I, can't. oh, uh, Cosmos, but it's, it's not quite doing the same thing. So yeah. Um, I'm just going to kind of, it will feel fairly sp sporadic because I'll just jump between these questions, but we received a question from Ali who wants to know what is the strangest thing that is listed in the Farmer's Almanac and is there a present day equivalent, Jess? And is there a present day what? Equivalent. 
Oof. The almanac. Amazing question. It's really hard to say because I'm deeply obsessed with the almanac. And so I've read, I don't know. The how advice many... would be you've just got to go buy the almanac. It's, still, <laughs> it's still, still present, still applies. Also strange. I, I would say my favorites are in the 1790s, there's an early remedy for acne. And I can't tell you exactly what it was, but it sounded like it would just burn your whole face off. It was something like vinegar and a few other things. The other one that comes to mind is there was a, uh, a note that said, on this day, you should attend to your doves. And I just, I like to imagine that not everybody had doves they needed to attend to. And the modern day equivalent is that the our farmer's almanac is, is still in existence and you can still buy it and it is just as wonderfully weird, so. Mm -hmm. We had a question from Lindsay who I believe is not here to hear your answer, but we'll have a recording afterwards. So um, all questions uh, will be heard by everyone who posed them. Lindsay wanted to know, can you identify a moment of reading a discovery that sparked the idea for your book? Yes, this is actually perfect for me and Peter because uh, the moment that sparked uh, this book was like many journalists, I spend too much time on Twitter mm -hmm. and I started fo following Merriam-Webster's Twitter account, which is so funny and sassy and they were just kind of fact checking a lot of political figures, especially in the run up to the 2016 election, when people were, shall we say, a little bit loose with the way they use language and, you know, listing definitions for fact and other sort of basic things. And I remember hearing, at the same time, I kind of remembered a footnote from a college lecture that, you know, Noah Webster was a nationalist and I, I didn't ever think further beyond that. But then I, because of all of these tweets, I kind of went on this quest of looking into Webster and just finding this, this difference between how, what the dictionary has become and how it started it's so fascinating, which turned into an article uh, about the dictionary that then turned into this book. Mm, mm, mm. Lovely. Um, this, I guess this is slightly related. It, it seems like, you know, part of your kind of process of writing was just stumbling on surprise after surprise. Mm. And so Nicholas wants to know, what was the most surprising book or chapter that you came across in your research? This is a great question. I think, since we didn't touch on Dale Carnegie, I'm going to have to say Dale Carnegie, because he wrote How to Win Friends and Influence People, mm -hmm. uh, which I think a lot of us, myself included, sort of see as a, you know, a business text or an MBA type of text. And I was so surprised to learn of his history. You know, he grew up dirt poor on this Missouri farm at the turn of the 20th century. He kind of had this Dolly Parton moment where he wore clothes that were just patches all sewn together and he would ride to school on horseback and kids would make fun of him. And, you know, his earliest memories were having to burn these pigs that got cholera every year and they were in debt. And so that is what fascinated me was that this book, which is ostensibly about smiling and positivity and personality, comes from this person who was born from so much suffering and despair and lack. Mm -hmm. And it really made me think about the book in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. I think this kind of answers Fred's question, but maybe you could speak more to it, which is that Fred would like to know, um, would like you to give the audience a sense of the more recent books you've chosen and how maybe they speak to this notion of an unexpected history that you describe in your subtitle. Sure. So the last, I would say the, I mean, it, within the book, the most recent ones are from the 80s. Uh, so it's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and How to Heal Your Life, which to me, I kind of see self-help as the culmination of all of these different reference books, because mm -hmm. what it does is it kind of says what the reference books don't say out loud, which is this you know, unabashed yearning for more, to be better, to be loved, to be prettier, to be smarter, happier, richer. And I think self-help comes along and just kind of slays that all out. And so I, I would even argue that some of the more, some of the books that are coming out today would fall under that, that same uh, umbrella. A lot of the, and I think anything that is, is self-help and is very popular, I think even if you were to look at someone like Rachel Hollis, she exemplifies a lot of what is problematic about that genre today in terms of magical thinking and this idea that your thoughts can change your life. Yeah, I was going to ask, and this, we've received a few questions about this in the chat. What are the kind of contemporary examples? Do you have other contemporary examples? Other ones. It's, it's hard to say. Again, I think a lot of the things that, that fall under the sort of best-selling self-help category would sort of fit the bill, but 
What I argue a little bit is that some of these books have, it's, it's hard to have a Webster equivalent. It's hard to have, you know, an Emily Post equivalent because the nature of our world and the nature of books, but also just the things that we consume is so much more disparate now, which I think is great because it means there's so many more voices, but it, it means that there's not a hundred million people reading the same book anymore. And it's not having the same profound effect on them as it did in, you know, 1950 or 1850, I would argue. Right. Lovely. Well, if anyone else has any more questions, please go ahead and post them because now I, I, I just have some of my own that I will, I will ask. <laughs> Jess, you wrote in your introduction that um, in writing the book, you found yourself at times disappointed by, but also at times nostalgic for the United States. When were you disappointed? And when were you nostalgic? Well, I was disappointed a lot, I will say. I was disappointed to discover that Benjamin Franklin owned slaves. That was something that I had never learned. Um, I think I was just, I felt very disillusioned, uh, which I think is, is in many ways a theme of 2020. I felt disillusioned by a lot of the stories that I had been told about what America represents and this idea that it's open to all and if you can work hard, you can make it. And that was that was difficult to stomach, um, but I think is a necessary part of really understanding our history. Um, the, the things that, that heartened me were sort of, were sort of the small things where the idea that, you know, you can appreciate things that that you've judged you can see things through a different lens for me that was you know i had really judged del carnegie i had really judged self-help but i hope that through this book people can find a delight in the mundane because that's what it brought to me you know the joy of of small things and and that's what so many of these books really are are about at their heart about kind of looking a little bit more closely around for the things that we take for granted. Mm, that's certainly applicable in a time of confinement, no? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, and writing during confinement was real fun too. <laughs> um, Jim wants to know, would you ever consider Bill Wilson and Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 steps as part? This is amazing. This was actually in my original list. Um, oh, fantastic. Yes. Well, what else was in your original list? And that actually, that and, and Cosmos are the only two that I ended up taking off. I think that's a perfect example because Bill Wilson, who wrote uh, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, is, is a perfect example of this. Um, it came out in, I want to say 1939, but it really was born out of the depression and of a lot of um, veterans of World War One who mm. were struggling with alcoholism. Yeah. The book is what I think is fascinating about it. And what I love about that book is that it it introduces the idea that community and asking for help can be a part of American story of the American story and not just this sort of diehard individualism that we see in so many of these other books. The reason why I didn't ultimately end up including it is that unlike, you know, some of these other authors, I don't think Bill Wilson was thinking about how do I impose a notion of American identity? I think he was just thinking, how do I stop drinking and how do I help other people who can't stop drinking? Um, but it's a beautiful book. And I think it, it really does exemplify a lot of these same themes. Lovely. Uh, I guess one final question, Jess, because it's rare at evenings with an author that we have a first time author who's so young. I won't reveal your age because I promise not to um, in the green room, but can you just tell everyone, you know, what was it like kind of coming up with this idea, the book proposal, the kind of more, as you say, mundane practicalities of writing your first book and what does that look like maybe for other people in the audience who are considering writing a book for the first time? Sure, that's a great question. Um, I would say writing a book proposal is actually harder than writing a book. <laughs> Because you write a you know a seventy page proposal before you have any funding and you have to do all this research and come up with a thesis and all of that. But what I found so rewarding about it was that you really get to go so much deeper. I know I work as a journalist the rest of the time, and you get to go so much deeper than a fifteen hundred word article or even a two thousand word article. Uh, and the other thing I would say about the process of writing this book is that. At the time, um, I was working, you know, part time in a bar in, in New York City, and I think it, it's one of those things that a lot of <laughs> writers do at one point or another in their lives, but it's something that I, I couldn't recommend more. I think, 
you know, actually getting out of your own headspace and being with other people and, you know, making money is something that is important. But I also think it, 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 it kind of solidified my interest in writing a book that was not about presidents and kings, but that was about everyday people, which is kind of where I've come from and, and what I'm interested in. So you would of course be referring to Sophie's Bar, who who's acknowledged who's acknowledged in your yeah, <laughs> everybody's got to put a dive bar in their acknowledgments of their book, I think, for it to be a real success. <laughs> That's one of the cool one of the cooler acknowledgments that I. <laughs> um, Jess, thank you so much for being with us this evening, and thank you, Peter, who's kind of faded and, and put himself on mute. But thank you for your wonderful um, questions, and thank you for your energy and um, for your attention to what is truly such a fantastic book. And again. If you, if you can, and you absolutely should pre-order Jess's book now, I'm gonna repost the link in the chat.